We'll begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Good. The prayer on the left side of our handout. Father, I abandon myself into your hands. Do with me what you will. Whatever you may do, I thank you. I am ready for all. I accept all. Let only your will be done in me and in all your creatures. I wish no more than this, O oh Lord. Into your hands I commend my soul. I offer it to you with all the love of my heart. For I love you, Lord, and so need to give myself, to surrender myself into your hands without reserve and with boundless confidence. For you are my Father. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, Teresa Bell. So um, I met with Father Thursday morning, He's, and we were talking about the silent retreat, the women's silent retreat. So I and about 41 other women went on that, and I had a really nice moment there. And if anyone gets the chance to do one of those, I would encourage you to take the time to do it. Um, so. I guess what I've come away from more than anything right now is silence has been, I never thought silence would be that special to me, but now I live in silence a lot. I usually had a radio on in the car or a TV on or well, the dog talks to me or I talk to the dog at home. And I have, I'm a hygienist, so four days a week I have about 10 to 12 patients that are in my chair every day. And there's not a lot of silence in my life during the week. so. I've been taking time to er learn about my silence. And um, it came down to more than anything is my gratitude. I think just the gratitude to God the Father to send his son into my life and to give me that hope and reassurance that I will have everlasting life forever just because I believe in what he's given us. Um, when we, I was on the silent retreat, I read a book called Cultivate, A Gracefield Guide to Growing an, Inter an Intentional Life by Laura Casey. And it's an intentional life as in not just today, tomorrow, maybe the next five years, but what will the next till I'm 85 years old look like? Will I be grateful? Will I be gratitude, you know, show people that I'm grateful for the life that I have and maybe help share to them what they need to be gr grateful for. Um, I worked at community health for 10 years and saw every walk of life there. You know, like we were talking about the refugees, I probably saw 85 different countries come through that place. And we as Americans are so lucky to be born here and not be chosen to be, you know, be born in that area of life where you don't have a choice where you live or where you grew up. So we are really taking things for granted here. Um, but one of the questions that Father had said to me, or had said on the retreat was, do I believe that I myself am good and that I was created in beauty? Um, am I worth God's time to create me? And that was an interesting question to me. I never thought of it that way. Was I worth his time? Um, that was one of my questions that really struck me. And then the other one was, sorry, I have to find this. <coughs> Well, maybe it was that. That was good. Um, and so I went out walking one day. Um, in, we're at Broom Tree. If, if you haven't been out there, it's just a beautiful. We have quite a few acres that you can go walk amongst the stream. And then there's a other, another whole area. And I was out walking, and I was just thanking Jesus and just saying, thank you for coming into my life. Thank you for giving my parents that love Jesus and shared that with me at a very young age. I was raised Baptist. Never say never. Never thought I'd be Catholic. Um, and uh, you get married and you do some strange things. Um, <laughs> and then I had to choose whether or not I was going to follow him in the church and have children and raise them in the Catholic faith instead of my Baptist faith. And you know, it all comes down to the same thing. We're all going to the same place. We're all trying to be the same. So in my silence, I, I was just thanking him for giving me my Baptist faith first, that I had all the scripture written in my heart and 
growing up. And now I have this Catholic faith, which is putting the old stuff in with the, with, you know, the traditional stuff, I should say, that I've lost along the way or didn't know. Um, so as I was walking, I always go out, nature is my way, God's way of talking to me. And I'm walking along and I was just thanking him and just saying, thank you for shedding your blood for me. Thank you for being there for me. And I always like to take some kind of trinket home. And I found a little rock that was like literally in the shape of a human heart, not a heart heart, but a human heart. And it just spoke to me, you know, that that was God's way of saying, I'm listening to you. I'm hearing you. I, you have my heart. I have your heart. Continue believing in this. And as in the second day, I went out walking, and it was chilly, very chilly, actually. So we bundled up, and we're out walking, and I'm just thanking God again and just saying, I just can't believe that you shed your blood on the cross for me. And as I was walking, um, there's oak trees all around and just dead oak leaves everywhere. And you didn't think anything of it, you know, just walk. And along the path, there is a perfect, about this big, crimson red maple leaf. And I thought, where did that come from? Why is there a maple leaf amongst all these dead, you know, oak leaves? And why, you know, it's been a couple weeks, it's November 8th, so it's like these leaves should be all dried up. And there was absolutely no maple leaf or no tree around whatsoever. But here's this one crimson leaf. And I thought, God's listening to me. He's talking to me. He's telling me, I got this. You got this. You need to keep sharing that, sharing that love and that faith and that gratitude. So as I've gone about, I've always kind of shared with my patients, I've not gotten yelled at yet from my boss, but I always take the time to ask people, do you, you know, like, how's your Advent season? That's a good opener, you know? And you just know right away, you click with someone that's a believer or whatever, and we get to talk, we have some great conversations. And people that don't know, you're just like, well, find your Advent. What, what do you think would help you find Christ in this, in this moment of Advent season? And, He's here for you. He'll meet you wherever you need to be met. So that's what other things. But getting back to the silence thing now, I'll just kind of close with that. It's the spirit of gratitude. It's being thankful, embracing the tension of God that God can create in our own mess. He can let God's grace can still lead me in my own mess. And I may not be perfect and might not have everything in the order, but somehow he's using each one of us in our daily life um, to talk to others and take the time and silence just when you're driving to work instead of listening to the radio and something maybe take time to pray that day this Advent season and just say well, who can I share God with today um, allowing ourselves to just be in the silence I couldn't believe when well, my daughter said like, mom you're really going to do that I can't believe you're going to be quiet for three days and I only spoke once and it was when they had a really good meal and I asked for the recipe <laughs> that was my only breakage I think but um it it was so overpowering just to be in silence and to listen to the you know just going outside and walking and hearing hearing God speak in his um there is a crick there um that's really quite loud when you go up to it, but if you go away from it, but I don't know if you can, I don't know if you can hear this, but it's quite loud. I can hear that. And to me, it was beautiful. I enjoyed it. I was just watching how the water ran and whatnot. But to someone else, it was noise and it was disturbing and you'll have to ask her her Patty Stromowski, you have to ask for her story sometime. She had a very unique experience with that. But just take this time in silence. Um, if you have an nativity scene or something at your home, take time to just pray in front of it and just ask Jesus to speak in your silence. It's a beautiful thing he has. Two things that are important for us to pay attention to. Number one, her ability to go in silence wasn't something she just commanded. Her ability to go into silence and to appreciate silence and to be changed was going on the retreat. Right? And the going on the retreat wasn't 
It was maybe a little more like, maybe, maybe not, right? So sometimes we, we're, we're, we want to get somewhere, but God is going to take us there by going this direction, and that requires a little more like, ah, I don't know. So if we're in front of like a little bit of attention, that's good. That might be exactly what God wants from us, and so we take the leap uh, and go. Uh, the second thing that's really interesting that we pay attention is the ways in which Teresa is provoked is from something external to her, right? The maple leaf. And I don't even know if you even could see, like, she, she, like, was moved. Like, you got it. Like, the maple leaf, the objective created thing, brought her into a relationship with the uncreated, with God. You got it. And so even when you said that, Teresa, I'm like, oh, yeah, you got all of this. <laughs> I mean, it was like so easy for me to even like be free. The proclamation, what you shared with me was simply what you received. And when you said, you got it, I'm like, oh, yeah, you got this whole thing, Lord. You got this whole thing. The stream, right? The objective order of things. But so often we got... We have to be willing to go to a place to sort of put ourselves in front of that. And the thing that's objective to it sometimes is the one who comes in front of us and says, hey, you should go on retreat. You should go on retreat. Maybe that's the voice of God. So next December, in your bulletins, it's already listed, uh, there's a couple's retreat. Now, it's not silent. So maybe this is God's first way of getting you in. But I would encourage you guys, you've got a long way to prepare you and your spouse, come to Broom Tree with me. Uh, I get to direct it, so I think we'll have a great time. And the reason I put these in so early is I have three sisters. I have four sisters, and they fill it up with all of their friends. <laughs> <laughs> so I want all of you to get there. So call before they get all their friends. But I think everybody that was even on the waiting list for the silent retreat got in. So be at peace. Okay. On your list, I want to hear from you some of what and who is on this sheet. Obviously, if it's private, personal, deep, something you're not prepared to like speak publicly, don't, that's not what I'm asking for. But I want to hear from you, uh, like popcorn. <laughs> do, 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 do. Just uh, one of the stories that's in the slots, or one of the things that's in the slot, say your name, something that's in the slot, or, and the person that's associated with it. Well, I can go. Okay. Uh, Jessica Schultz, uh, the most important influential person other than your family. Um, I had a professor in college, I worked with him for three years, he was my music professor, and he's still, to this day, one of my best friends. He was the first person who kind of helped me uncover how to sort of unpack and deal with worry. Um, and with the first person, which should be common sense, that said to me, if you can't control it, don't worry about it. Because truly, if, if it's not something that you can change in any way, then why are you wasting your time on it? And for me, that was really at 19 years old and epiphany. Mm -hmm. And he has been a mentor to me for many years. And it's just little pieces of wisdom like that that he drops in my lap in a text or um, in an email or he'll show up when I'm having, you know, I'm having a particularly tough time and he'll be like, hey, I'm going to be in town tomorrow. Let's go to lunch. It's like he knows when I need him. And, um, you know, for 20 plus years now, he's just been a tremendous influence on me. Perfect. Thank you. Next piece of popcorn. Pop up. Or just speak up. Jeff Weiss, my first childhood memory is trying to take to China with my sister. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. <laughs> Don Altman. I remember trying to write my name, learning to write my name, and my mom sitting down with me writing my name at about four years old. Mm.
stinks. We're going to keep going. So just keep. If you think you're going to hold out on me. <laughs> yep. Great. Right. I knew. I'll even take a different question. Okay. It was just about eight, nine years ago. <laughs> yes, we had buses back then. <laughs> I didn't go there, but. A couple more? Two more? Let's do two more. Chad Schultz, uh, I'll take the easy one. Uh, my favorite hobby is uh, music and being a musician. I've always felt really blessed that I was given that gift. So mm. I appreciate that every day. Thanks. Thank you. I think Rob synthesized our reading. You'll learn something from it. Interesting thing about what almost everybody says is that they are in relationship to a community, to people. Right? We live in community. Nobody is born out in some woods somewhere uh, and then just one day surprisingly discovers there's like others like us. <laughs> we are created in a way in which we are born into those that are like us, those that are of us, other human beings. We're born into families of whatever shapes and sizes they are uh, and families are a part of communities. It's like inside us to be in relationship to others and only when one discovers that that's a wounding experience would you go in a different direction. Right? Otherwise, we naturally tend to be in relationship to others. And if you watch kids, most kids prove this to us. Because when Bobby is playing with the toy train, and Cindy discovers that Bobby is playing with the toy plane, train, she begins a relationship with Bobby. And it usually has to do with taking that train. 
Right? We're in relationship to each other, okay? naturally. And it grows. Wherever you go, there's these relationships. But the difficulty is that uh, that relationship comes with oftentimes difficulty, or you know, the, the difficulty is it comes with the fact the other person is different than me. And <clears throat> we celebrate on Gaudete Sunday here this gift that in this third week of Advent, there's a joy that comes, there's a rejoicing. There's, and I don't know about you guys, but I totally experienced it at Mass today. I was like, I am so grateful to be the pastor here. During the Eucharistic prayer, I don't want to, not everybody, this doesn't happen all the time, and you don't have to have it happen to you. But I really like the Eastern Church, which is like the Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, if you ever, if you're familiar with any of that, Ukrainian Orthodox, they're the Eastern Church. When they think about the divine liturgy, they don't think in the way we do. Number one, we think of Mass in regard to Eucharist, in regard to communion, and that's a good thing, right? There was a day when you maybe received communion once a year or twice a year, like it's a good thing. But we like, we like whether I do or don't receive communion is like everything for Mass. That's, the, that's a reduction of what the liturgy is. And in the West, we're so much about it that we want to know the point, maybe you guys have thought this, what's the point at Mass when Jesus is actually there? You ever thought about that? Like, the bread's back there on the table, so is it the fact that when it's put on the altar that it becomes Jesus? Okay, when Father starts saying prayers, well, is when Father starts saying prayers, because Father's the one that has to, is it when the hands come down and the Holy Spirit's on it? Well, in the West, we are the kind of people like Thomas Aquinas, who we know that it's when the words are spoken that Jesus spoke by the validly ordained priest with the matter of unleavened bread and wine that Jesus is there. So when those words come out of my mouth, this is my body given for Jesus. In the East, they're like, oh yeah, it happens sometime in there. Well, that's what I experienced at Mass today. I was like, yeah, it's just happening sometime in here. Sometime in here, like, is outside of time. I don't know how to explain it, but there was, like, this beautiful silence, and you could hear it. Everybody went quiet. Did you hear that? Or was it just me? Maybe it was just me. <laughs> what a beautiful celebration. Rejoice. Like, the Lord is near. Okay? And... This here is this deal. The, my, the section is, you have turned my morning into dancing. So the last two weeks, the last time, all of a sudden, something's like beginning to well up. Right? There's something good happening, and we begin to sense that. And in the chapter, he says, perhaps you believe, though, right? maybe you don't experience that, perhaps you believe that if a certain enemy who persecuted you disappeared, then you'd finally receive the peace that everybody else has. I was really grateful that you mentioned your difficult story because there was a temptation that it's always easy to talk about the good things. It's always easy for me to Facebook about positive things and nobody realizes the tumult that goes with my life, that goes with our life. And so then when you think it's all beautiful and grand, oh my gosh, then when you don't experience that or you get the opposite side, you're like, I must be doing something wrong. Or when you come up against the person who doesn't seem to be following the plan, you think this can't be what's supposed to happen. But he's posing that perhaps the person who is most obstinate, the person who is most difficult for us, is the person who is going to help us most come to this place of rejoicing in the Lord. And he talks about on the page 30, of into your hands, Father. He says that the first precaution is to understand that you have come to the monastery, right? He's talking to monks, right? Wilfred Stinnison actually is from the East. You've come to the monastery so that all may fashion you. How about this parish?
what if there's someone in our parish? Mm, I can't say the word. Is a jack. What if there's someone in our parish that is a wretch? What if there's someone in our parish that is going to hurt you? Not in a bad, but like maybe say something to you or they're going to they're going to be mean to you or or is our parish going to be all really kind nice people my guess is every single one of most people want our parish to be kind nice people there's a problem with that you already have one who has to go. You may get the good side of me. And God has given me grace to change my life and ways in 15 years are like incomprehensible to me. But I promise you, if you hang out with me long enough, you are going to discover something you despise about me. I promise you. And I can give you a list of 10 people who will tell you my greatest faults. Is it possible you have faults too? Is, could we be a place in which we say, you know what, I might run up against somebody that I hate. I might run up against somebody I don't like. I might run up against somebody that uh, is a burden to me. But maybe they're the enemy God is putting in my path to help me discover that he is my What I've noticed in my relationships with people is that in general, God shows them the good parts of me first. Because <laughs> then when the difficult parts come, it's harder to run away. Because there's already a relationship there. And you sort of go away and then you start praying and you start thinking and you start, and then you gotta come back. And I think this is the case with most people, most relationships, right? Isn't this marriage? Right? You meet the one, you're like, woohoo! You start waking up early in the morning and taking a shower for once, and you're like, can't wait to clean up your house. You know, someone's coming to dinner. I was talking with somebody the other day, and, you know, they wanted to go through their stuff and clean everything up, and I thought, you must have met someone. <laughs> right? But then marriage, when you really get to it, I do know a few people that have really beautiful, blessed marriages, and there's like no disagreement. It's, but very, I just know a few. The rest of us, the rest of you, are like, you know, some days you're hot, and some days you're cold. Some days you're in the bed, and some days you're on the couch. <laughs> you know? But if you are aware of that beginning, of that, of that dynamic that happened, you, you stay with it. You stay with it. You go back to it. You're like, oh my gosh, what is it here, you know? And it's always with the caveat, I think it's good you offered what you did. There's days when you just got to like look at life and say, where am I and how do I get out of this craziness? But for the most part, we're all craziness. All craziness, that's the church. And the, so the question becomes, is God here? And if God is here, then, and if he's the one that has brought us together, which is the question of marriage, right? Is God the one who brought us together? Am I here freely of my own will because God has me here? Uh, th the person in the pew right in front of me, in the, they might be a pain in the rear just so that I grow. And that's what, God, that's what we're talking about in the reading today. Uh, if we fail to see and understand that God is using everything to fashion He's using everything to fashion me. Even the people that are difficult. 
even the circumstances that are difficult. Imagine your anxiety, Jessica, right? Would you ask God to go back into your life at 19 and take away all anxiety and all difficulties, uh, but also with it means he takes away this person in your life? That's what we're talking about. Does that make sense? When we're on the other end of it, we say, I'm so grateful for the anxiety because the anxiety put me in a position where I had a need that put me in a position to be in relationship with this person, and this person now, years later, is a huge, huge help to me. Well, ultimately, even this person, maybe not, but even this person, if you were to like spend more and more, would have something you'd be like, oh, he's kind of crazy, right? Okay? So there's always going to be something. And this is why, ultimately, only the Spirit of God, only Christ, is the one that can totally fulfill everything we're looking for. But he uses people to reach us, to, to get there. Okay? So through that relationship with a person, we grow in our relationship with him in this companionship. Um, so he says, if you fail to observe this precaution, you will not know how to overcome your sensitiveness and feelings, nor will you get along well in the community, nor free yourself from many stumbling blocks and evils. Okay? And part of the difficulty is we are sensitive. And so in front of, we like, <gasps> as opposed to just like, oh man, here I am doing it again. I hate when people poke me on this button. Beam, Lord, Lord. Right? I hate to be surprised. Uh, I, I take that back. I like to be surprised. I hate to be surprised by things that I don't want. Does that make sense? Yeah, Adrienne works with me. She knows. Okay, if I love it and I'm surprised, I'm like, wow, great. But if it's something I'm not on board with and you surprise me, ooh. Now, God's grace has caused me to zip it. Think for a moment. Great. Great really not that big of a deal, John. Let go of control. Okay. Now what should we do? Much better position than what are we doing? <laughs> okay. okay. So we all uh, are in this position that we're sensitive. We're sensitive and we need, to, we need to not be sensitive in that wrong way so that we can be reasonable and let other people be who they're going to be, have their faults they're going to have, and just stop and we can respond in a way to say, okay, now how do we go forward with this? And then we can listen to other people be totally unreasonable and just listen. And then over time, they can calm down. But we do that because we've first gone through it too. Okay? One of the things that I've... This is an image I use to grow in this. What do we have? A street, right? A neighborhood. This is house number one, and this is house number two. This is the kind of people that like things the way they are, like tradition, like growing up in comfortability. These are the, this is the kind of family that we're going to do something totally new. We're going to add the house to the neighborhood that has all straight lines and a yellow front door. Okay? They're different. We're going to have little parties on the rooftop. Everybody's going to hear. We're going to have our nice little parties in the backyard. We got a fence. The dog won't get in your yard. We promise. The road that goes between the two. Anytime I am disturbed, I have a part to play. Anytime you are disturbed, anytime, by any person, you have a part to play. Stay on your side of the street.
pay attention to the trash that's in your yard. Even if it's only one candy wrapper, just go get that, pick it up, and wave hello. Let your witness be what they see. Let them be who God created them and trust that God has a path for them too. And maybe God's path is for you to be invited over into their house and to live in such a way that after you leave, they suddenly desire to pick up. Even if it's merely a candy bar wrapper in the midst of all kinds of things. Stay on my side of the street. Take care of my yard. Let everybody else's be taken care of by them and by God. You never know the path that they have walked. I grew up in the north end of Sioux Falls. Loved the north end. There was a house on the corner that I'm guessing they hadn't cut the vines in 30 years. There was an old, old, old vehicle, black, with a round top, in the driveway. And the driveway was just two paths and then grass grew in between the two, two cement paths and then grass grew in the two, two. And the tires, it had sat there for so long, the tires were flat. The paint was peeling off of the White House, so it almost looked brown. I'm not sure the last time that the roof was repaired. We knew an old lady lived there. It was the spooky house that we all told stories about near Halloween. When I sobered up, I moved to the Christ the King neighborhood, and a lady across the street from us told us a story about a woman who she had befriended, and the woman wouldn't let her in her home. But if she invited her to holidays, she would come over to the other house. Something peaked in me and I thought, it couldn't be. And the Argus leader did a story on their friendship. When the lady in the house in my neighborhood, who I never knew, I never had the willingness to go meet, I'm not sure anybody in our neighborhood did, we all just knew her as the crazy lady in the spooky house. When she died, in her will, she left the house and everything in it to this other woman. And inside this house was the fruit of hoarding. She never took her trash out. Everything that was trash, she burned in her oven. In the attic of this home were original paintings of Oscar Howe. This woman's mother had a personal friendship with him. And in the will it said, the house and everything in it. When we stick to our side of the street, it doesn't mean that we no longer enter other people's lives. It means we pay more attention to our life. And we see that there's a lot of stuff in us that needs to change. But God is near. And because of that, we're capable of going out and crossing the street and entering people's lives aware that they're going to have things that are messy too. But God comes to them. He comes through you. What a gift it is to have people that initially appear like enemies. By God's grace, they become our friends. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. John Paul II, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Go in peace. Right? Maybe you don't experience that. Perhaps you believe that if a certain enemy who persecuted you disappeared, then you'd finally receive the peace that everybody else has. I was really grateful that you mentioned your difficult story because there was a temptation that it's always easy to talk about the good things. It's always easy for me to Facebook about positive things. And nobody realizes the tumult that goes with my life, that goes with our life. And so then when you think it's all beautiful and grand, oh my gosh, then when you don't experience that or you get the opposite side, you're like, I must be doing something wrong. Or when you come up against the person who doesn't seem to be following the plan, you think this can't be what's supposed to happen. But he's posing that perhaps... The person who is most obstinate, the person who is most difficult for us, is the person who is going to help us most come to this place of rejoicing in the Lord. And he talks about on the page 30 of Into Your Hands, Father, he says that the first precaution is to understand that you have come to the monastery, right, he's talking to monks, right, Wilfred Stinnison actually is from the East, You've come to the monastery so that all may fashion you. How about this parish? What if there's someone in our parish Mm, I can't say the word, is a jack. What if there's someone in our parish that is a wretch? What if there's someone in our parish that is going to hurt you? Not in a bad, but like maybe say something to you or they're going to they're gonna be mean to you or... Or is our parish going to be all really kind, nice people? My guess is every single one of most people want our parish to be kind, nice people. There's a problem with that. You already have one who has to go. you may get the good side of me. And God has given me grace to change my life in ways in 15 years that are like incomprehensible to me. But I promise you, if you hang out with me long enough, you are going to discover something you despise about me. I promise you. And I can give you a list of 10 people who will tell you my greatest faults. Is it possible you have faults too? Is, could we be a place in which we say, you know what, I might run up against somebody that I hate. I might run up against somebody I don't like. I might run up against somebody that uh, is a burden to me. But maybe they're the enemy God is putting in my path to help me discover that he is my friend. What I've noticed in my relationships with people is that in general, God shows them the good parts of me first. Because <laughs> then when the difficult parts come, it's harder to run away because there's already a relationship there. And you sort of go away and then you start praying and you start thinking and you start, and then you gotta come back. 
And I think this is the case with most people, most relationships, right? Isn't this marriage? Right? You meet the one, you're like, woohoo! You start waking up early in the morning and taking a shower for once, and you're like, can't wait to clean up your house. You know, someone's coming to dinner. I was talking with somebody the other day, and, you know, they wanted to go through their stuff and clean everything up, and I thought, you must have met someone. <laughs> right? But then marriage, when you really get to it, I do know a few people that have really beautiful, blessed marriages, and there's like no disagreement. It's, but very, I just know a few. The rest of us, the rest of you, I like, you know, some days you're hot and some days you're cold. Some days you're in the bed and some days you're on the couch. <laughs> you know? But if you are aware of that beginning, of that, of that dynamic that happened, you, you stay with it. You stay with it. You go back to it. You're like, oh my gosh, what is it here, you know? And it's always with the caveat, I think it's good you offered what you did. There's days when you just got to like look at life and say, where am I and how do I get out of this craziness? But for the most part, we're all craziness. All craziness, that's the church. And the, so the question becomes, is God here? And if God is here, then, and if he's the one that has brought us together, which is the question of marriage, right? Is God the one who brought us together? Am I here freely of my own will because God has me here? Uh, the person in the pew right in front of me, in the, they might be a pain in the rear just so that I grow. And that's what, God, that's what we're talking about in the reading today. Uh, if we fail to see and understand that God is using everything to fashion me, he's using everything to fashion me, even the people that are difficult, even the circumstances that are difficult. Imagine your anxiety, Jessica, right? Would you... Ask God to go back into your life at 19 and take away all anxiety and all difficulties, uh, but also with it means he takes away this person in your life. That's what we're talking about. Does that make sense? When we're on the other end of it, we say, I'm so grateful for the anxiety because the anxiety put me in a position where I had a need that put me in a position to be in relationship with this person and this person, now years later, is a huge, huge help to me. Well, ultimately, even this person, maybe not, but even this person, if you were to like spend more and more, would have something you'd be like, oh, he's kind of crazy, right? Okay, so there's always going to be something. And this is why, ultimately, only the Spirit of God, only Christ, is the one that can totally fulfill everything we're looking for. But he uses people to reach us, to, to get there. Okay, so through that relationship with a person, we grow in our relationship with him in this companionship. Um, so he says, if you fail to observe this precaution, you will not know how to overcome your sensitiveness and feelings, nor will you get along well in the community, nor free yourself from many stumbling blocks and evils. Okay, and part of the difficulty is we are sensitive. And so in front of, we like, <gasps> as opposed to just like, oh man, here I am doing it again. I hate when people poke me on this button. Beam, Lord, Lord. Right? I hate to be surprised. Uh, I, I take that back. I like to be surprised. I hate to be surprised by things that I don't want. Does that make sense? Yeah, Adrian works with me. She knows. Okay, if I love it and I'm surprised, I'm like, wow, great. But if it's something I'm not on board with and you surprise me, ooh. Now, God's grace has caused me to zip it. Think for a moment. Great really not that big of a deal, John. Let go of control. Okay. Now what should we do? Much better position than, what are we doing? <laughs> okay. okay. So we all uh, are in this position that we're sensitive. We're sensitive, and we need to, we need to not be sensitive in that wrong way. 
so that we can be reasonable and let other people be who they're going to be, have their faults they're going to have, and just stop and we can respond in a way to say, okay, now how do we go forward with this? And then we can listen to other people be totally unreasonable and just listen. And then over time, they can calm down. But we do that because we've first gone through it too. Okay? One of the things that I've... This is an image I use to grow in this. What do we have? A street, right? A neighborhood. This is house number one, and this is house number two. This is the kind of people that like things the way they are, like tradition, like growing up in comfortability. These are the, this is the kind of family that we're going to do something totally new. We're going to add the house to the neighborhood that has all straight lines and a yellow front door. Okay? They're different. We're going to have little parties on the rooftop. Everybody's going to hear. We're going to have our nice little parties in the backyard. We got a fence. The dog won't get in your yard. We promise. The road that goes between the two. Anytime I am disturbed, I have a part to play. Anytime you are disturbed, anytime, by any person, you have a part to play. Stay on your side of the street. Pay attention to the trash that's in your yard. Even if it's only one candy wrapper, just go get that, pick it up, and wave hello. Let your witness be what they see. Let them be who God created them, and trust that God has a path for them too. And maybe God's path is for you to be invited over into their house and to live in such a way that after you leave, they suddenly desire to pick up. Even if it's merely a candy bar wrapper in the midst of all kinds of things. Stay on my side of the street. Take care of my yard. Let everybody else's be taken care of by them and by God. You never know the path that they have walked. I grew up in the north end of Sioux Falls. Loved the north end. There was a house on the corner that I'm guessing they hadn't cut the vines in 30 years. There was an old, old, old vehicle, black, with a round top, in the driveway, and the driveway was just two paths and then grass grew in between the two, two cement paths and then grass grew in the two, two. And the tires, it had sat there for so long the tires were flat. The paint was peeling off of the white house so it almost looked brown. I'm not sure the last time that the roof was repaired. We knew an old lady lived there. It was the spooky house that we all told stories about near Halloween. When I sobered up, I moved to the Christ the King neighborhood, and a lady across the street from us told us a story about a woman who she had befriended, and the woman wouldn't let her in her home. But if she invited her to holidays, she would come over to the other house. Something peaked in me and I thought, it couldn't be. And the Argus leader did a story on their friendship.
When the lady in the house in my neighborhood, who I never knew, I never had the willingness to go meet, I'm not sure anybody in our neighborhood did, we all just knew her as the crazy lady in the spooky house. When she died, in her will, she left the house and everything in it to this other woman. And inside this house was the fruit of hoarding. She never took her trash out. Everything that was trash, she burned in her oven. In the attic of this home were original paintings of Oscar Howe. This woman's mother had a personal friendship with him. And in the will it said, the house and everything in it. When we stick to our side of the street, it doesn't mean that we no longer enter other people's lives. It means we pay more attention to our life. And we see that there's a lot of stuff in us that needs to change. But God is near. And because of that, we're capable of going out and crossing the street and entering people's lives aware that they're going to have things that are messy too. But God comes to them. He comes through you. What a gift it is to have people that initially appear like enemies. By God's grace, they become our friends. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. John Paul II, pray for us. in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace.